All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. I'm your host, Matt Hines. Really excited to have you all here joining us. If you are here live on LinkedIn in the middle of your work week and work day, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is a benefit of being a, a live participant. You can actually be part of the show. If you have a question or a comment or a rebuttal on our topic today, uh, feel free to throw <laughs> in the LinkedIn comments. We will see those as we go. Rebuttal. That's right, Rusty. We could get into an argument with someone. It'll be this live radio, live LinkedIn. You never know what's going to happen. Happen. So we encourage it. a little bit of healthy friction here on Sales Pipeline Radio. So if you've got a comment question, throw that in and we'll make you part of the show. If you happen to be listening or watching on demand, uh, thank you for downloading and subscribing. Uh, you can catch every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio, past, present, and future at salespipelineradio.com. Today, we're going to talk about sales enablement. And when I think of sales enablement, I think of Rusty Bishop. PhD, oh. Dr. Bishop, uh, who is the CMO of Big Tin Can, but also um, just I've, I've learned a ton from you and from the work that you've done around sales enablement. So excited for this conversation today. Thanks for joining us. Awesome, Matt. Thanks for the introduction. I, I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a long road, <laughs> but hey, we're here. I, mean, I love it. it. I mean, some of the first research we did around sales enablement was like six, seven years ago. It feels like it was just yesterday, but like we yeah. literally couldn't use the phrase sales enablement in the research because no one really knew what that was. They knew the functions behind it, but the phrase, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of category of sales enablement really hadn't taken root yet. Fast yeah. forward to late 2022, it, it feels like it's become kind of table stakes for leading organizations. Talk about the evolution you've seen and where you think sales enablement is today in terms of the maturity curve. Yeah, not to bore, not to bore your audience. So I, I started in this field, but back when sales enablement was called apps, um, which was like everybody found this thing called an iPhone or an iPad and decided that they were going to create an app for it. And uh, my my general impression is that is what became sales enablement. I think sales enablement has been around forever, right? It's how you make your salespeople better at interacting with your customers, right? So that you can go and, and close more deals. It's it's been happening since the dawn of some selling something. Um, I think what's happened over the last, you know, at least five to six years is an evolution of that into a real practice. And mm -hmm. along with that practice comes things like software and things like what we do here at Big Ten Can. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. What I'm here to talk about today is uh, why CMOs should care and what it could mean to CMOs and uh, what it could mean to marketing in general. And uh, that's something I've had it's kind of a personal seat at the table at because I founded a company that initially created apps. That's what we did for large corporations to help their salespeople sell stuff. As simple as it gets. Along the way, oh, you like give a question? Fire away, man. No, go for it. Keep going. You're all right. Along the way, I got to go out and train literally thousands of salespeople on how to use apps. Apps, I'm going to use that in air quotes. Um, but back before that was cool. And um, I interacted with a ton of marketers along and who were buying these things for salespeople. And it came out of marketing's budget. Um, I still think it's something I'd love to talk to you about today if we can is like, who should own it? Um, why should they own it? I think it's really important that we have this discussion. Um, but so, yeah, it has vastly changed uh, since I started in this field and it's really become something that's table stakes. The best companies not only have it, but they have practice, best practices around it. They're hiring the best people they possibly can to come in and be the enablers. I'm going to use that again in air quotes uh, of their sales team. You know, let's talk about that issue of ownership because I remember back, you know, when we first started doing some work in what was sort of this fledgling sales enablement group. I mean, like it has existed for a long time. I think it's helpful that it is now has a name, has a category that's elevated its importance and prominence in the organization. Historically, I found that those functions resided with product marketing and the yeah. execution was a lot of sell sheets and a lot of tactical work that just sort of helped the sales team know what the product does. Right. But that didn't necessarily help them create the why. It didn't necessarily help them sort of like loosen the status quo and get a commitment to change. So where exactly. ownership in the past has maybe been on the product marketing or the product development side, you know, and in many organizations today, you see sales enablement maybe as a component of sales training. Mm -hmm. The most innovative programs I've seen have been where sales enablement is actually owned by the CMO owned on the marketing organization. I'm sure there isn't a one size fits all, but for all for the for the sales enablement implementations you've seen, what do you see work best? Where is it best owned? Um, you know, it, it's what you said. It depends on the way that your organization goes to market, right? So in some in some companies, that owned by marketing is the right move for sales enablement because you have super intensive products that need lots of data sheets and sell sheets and PowerPoints and videos and AR and all these amazing things that are out there now to describe those products and prospects out in the field. Um, so whereas other organizations are very product led, right? And if you are product led, then I, I think it's okay for sales enablement to reside sometimes with sales, 
Um, you know, we're seeing more and more sales enablement teams getting a seat at the table. Um, I do think they should have a seat at the table. Um, and whether that sits ultimately under marketing or sales, everybody's got to have a hand in making it work. The organizations that I think are the best at it are where in sales and marketing are 100% aligned as to what they need to do to drive more revenue. Um, that, and when that doesn't happen, it doesn't work as well. And that's just the bottom line. And I think there's, I like your comment about ownership versus impact. Like we have the same conversation, I feel like, in terms of who owns the BDR function, who owns sales mm, development, or sales on it, there's marketing on it. Doesn't matter as long as they're doing the right job, as long as it's integrated appropriately into your sales and marketing, your go to market system so that it has a bigger impact. Exactly. It's all, to me, it's about impact, right? I think this is one of the, the challenges. And in, in, you know, I don't know if your, your, your podcast is called Sales Pipeline Radio. So I'm going to assume more sellers and marketers listen to this, but it's everyone's responsibility, in my opinion, to address the buyer and make sure that they're having a great buying experience. You and I did a study together, Matt. And what we found is that in general, sales and marketing are not aligned around creating a great buying experience. And that to me is, is, is amazing. So I, I do think it's everyone's responsibility to create that experience so that your customers find the right products to solve their problems. And ultimately that's what yeah. it comes down to for me. You know, I want my doctor to be buying the best products. I want the people who built my house to buy buying the best products, right? So if you think about it with that lens, it's everyone's responsibility. And that's that's a better way to me to look at it than true ownership. Ultimately, it's going to come down to where the budget lies and, and how your organization sets up. Well, and I, I would argue that sales enablement is, in some organizations, especially those with finite um, market opportunities or like very small niche markets, the marketing team may be focused more on sales enablement than they are demand gen, right? You may not oh, yeah. need to go generate new leads, but like how you enable the sales team to be more efficient, how you enable a consistent message across go to market channels. And, and I guess I, I, I bring this up to ask the question, how does this become like a leadership team or board level priority, especially in those niche markets where it can have a dramatic impact on the performance of the sales team? Well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's where I don't, I think there's a breakdown today is the, is the answer mm -hmm. to your question, right? I, you know, I, you and I participate in, in a group of CMOs that talk every week. And, you know, what we hear over and over again is I want to see the table. I want to see the table, but how do you get a seat at the table? How do you, how do you get the board to listen to the fact that sales enablement could be this important, right? The example yeah. you gave of a niche market. Um, the reality is I think most marketing teams and sales teams are going to be judged on revenue today. It is no longer just generate leads. Um, I, of course, there's exceptions to that rule, right? So to get a seat at the table, what you've got to have is a way to measure your impact on revenue. And mm -hmm. that's what the board is going to listen to, right? They're going to listen to, here's what I'm seeing in the marketplace today. Here's how I think we can affect that with the, what we have from a team, from processes, and from tools and ways that we can measure that. Here's where we, here's where we stand today, and here's how we're going to improve. A board's going to listen to that because it has dollars attached to it. And it's a different dashboard, though, too. Like if you're saying, OK, now all of a sudden I'm putting more resources and priority around sales enablement, like we yeah. as marketers, we have taught many of our leadership teams and board members to like the marketing of more, right? More clicks, more yeah. likes, more retweets, more visits, more leads. And so you got this beautiful up into the right chart that everyone wants to see. If yeah. I'm now putting more focus on sales enablement, what are some of the metrics I should be thinking about? that either leading indicator or lagging indicator can demonstrate uh, the, the impact sales enablement is having? I, lo I love that question. I think it's the right one to ask. The actual deal closing is the lagging indicator. Um, so I think one of the places that companies uh, can get a dramatic effect here is in measuring the leading indicators, right? And you want your board, or at least you want your management C-level to understand what the leading indicators are. Now they'll be different for virtually every company, although yeah. some of them are always the same, right? So what you can start to see is our enablement team, whether that's in training or that's in getting the right content to salespeople or in doing something like we're doing right now, facilitating an engagement, um, that should be measurable. And there should be, you should know your leading indicators for your company or your business or your vertical that lead to your lagging indicator, which is closed deals. Um, let's take an example of that, right? Let's take the one of content, something a lot of marketers like me are in, intimately familiar with because we have to create it, right? You talked about product marketing earlier, constantly creating decks and messaging and those kind of things. Um, I think a lot about brand these days. I think marketers care a boatload about brand and they think it's really important. How do you get your brand out there in front of your buyers and those kind of things? You can measure all of those things and their impact on actual deals very easily with the right sales enablement program. So great example. You might say, look, every time we show this deck, we close a deal. Every time we don't show this deck, we don't. It's right. really straightforward to do. 
every time a, a salesperson has taken this particular training, right, our customers renew. Every time they have it, they don't renew. These are easy things to measure. And those leading indicators will be different for every company. And every company that comes through the door here at Big Ten Can generally has a different set of leading indicators that affect what their boards want, what their investors want, and those kind of things. Yep. Yep. Agreed. We're talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Dr. Rusty Bishop. He's the CMO at Big Tin Can, and he's my go-to guy uh, for sales enablement conversations. But you mentioned yeah. earlier, we call this Sales Pipeline Radio. I think we probably do have a pretty good mix of sales and marketing folks here, but I, yeah. I believe very strongly that, that, that if you're in marketing, you need to understand sales. If you're in marketing, you need to know that your best metrics are not in your marketing automation platform. They're in CRM. The closer you get, Yep. To the numbers that, that that you can buy a beer with, the better off you are. Um, and and there's it, and, and there's a bunch. I mean, there's there's some common challenges that per, continue to persist that are that are points of tension between sales and marketing relative to sales enablement. And one of them is, you know, I've heard a stat that up to ninety percent of collateral and materials created for the sales organization by marketing goes unused. So yep. nine out of ten pieces that marketing painstakingly builds go as unused. Unfortunately. Oh. What I see, the response I see from a lot of marketers is, well, let's just go create less stuff. Let's create the one ring to rule them all, the one piece yeah. of collateral to rule them all. When unfortunately, the answer is usually you need a shitload more. Ooh, I don't know if I can say that, but okay, we'll have to put a little mark on this. You have to do, you have to create a lot more content for the right person, the right situation. Yeah. And this is where, I mean, I don't mean to be a salesperson, this is where the platforms come into play, right? To make sure that you've sure. got the right preci precise piece of piece of materials, the right pre precise piece of information for the, each prospect at the right place and right time. Yeah, the, the, way I, the way I like to think about that is the job of marketing is to maximize the number of opportunities for a sale. Yep. Pretty straightforward, right? How do you yep. do that? You've got to move from linear to nonlinear results. Um, you talk, you know, you know, I have a PhD. I'm nerdy about this kind of stuff. Um, and most people don't seek the best explanation. They seek the quickest explanation. Um, and the, the best explanation will actually prevent you from fooling yourself. So I think that that part of it is really, really critical. Uh, now, we talked about the things you were just saying reminded me. I just finished up a book called CMO to CRO, the revenue mm -hmm. takeover by the next generation executive by Brandy Starr, Mike Eller, Raleigh Keenan. Uh, this book actually taught me some things, right? It said, look, everybody's got to be thinking CRO. Everybody's got to be thinking, what are those metrics? What are the things we got to put in place? What are the processes, programs, software that we got to put in place so that we know how to generate the best results and we know how to go get the best explanations. And I think that last one is one that people miss. They miss yeah. the fact that without good explanations, you will absolutely fool yourself. Right. And you just gave a great example, which is we should just go quit creating marketing materials because no one's using it anyway. That's the wrong answer, right? The right answer to move to nonlinear results is how do we multiply what's working, right? How do we double down on what's working? Do it? Can I run an 80, 20 analysis of my marketing materials and say, look, whenever we put this type of slide in the deck, whenever we create this type of video, no one uses it. Okay. So that's the way you do that. So we think about that in a very different way. Um, that brings up another point, which I would I'd love to get your thoughts on. So one of the things I learned uh, during my PhD uh, was how you change things, how you bring about change. And, in, and when you're doing hard sciences, um, the main thing you're taught is you should only change one variable at a time. So that's one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately when I've been trying to think about sales enablement and marketing, because now I'm a marketer, right? <laughs> Full-time CMO. Um, is like, okay, what is the, are we changing too many variables? And I think this is another mm -hmm. big mistake that I see, Matt, is, uh, it, you know, I'm, are you changing the time? Are you changing the, the amount of stuff that you have? And if you're doing too many, there's no way to measure the outcome. So I think right. that's a principle that a lot of people could apply. And uh, it's, you know, you can look anything up about science and doing science research, those kind of things always says one variable change. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it depends on what your objective is, right? Like I worked, uh, you know, a couple jobs ago, many moons ago, I worked at a company, we were doing uh, direct response consumer advertising and we were, we were trying to just increase conversion rate. It was direct response is basically sort of, you know, we were on 15 second television ads, sending people to a landing page, trying to get them to fill out a form. This is, you know, years ago. Um, we had a thousand variables that we were playing with and trying to figure out what worked on those pages. And we went from having to test them individually to know what works. And then we found some software that would let us do like multivariate testing, right? Yeah, Where they could exactly. throw a bunch of variables together, but over the course of a few thousand impressions, they could say, well, whenever this one's together, whenever these two are together, we see better results. Right. But yeah. it's it's an interesting I mean, and what was valuable about that was I was able to increase the velocity of learning mm -hmm. 
without without losing the precision of the scientific testing right because i had to know what worked to make it sustainable but i wanted to test more things more quickly so i think there's you know it's a business decision sometimes sort of how you balance that but if you see something's working and you're like great that worked great can you replicate it if you can't then like why (laughs) <laughs> that's why you have to test things over and over again, right? You have to run your, you have to run your experiment. I'll, I'll use another scientific term here, right? Which is, you know, okay, this worked one time. Can I make it work five times out of 10? Can I make it work nine yep. times out of 10? And that's yep. again, how you move from linear to nonlinear results. The thing that I yep. think is most critical for everybody today is how to start thinking in terms of nonlinear results. It's really hard to do. Um, but the way you describe that's great. Uh, with sales enablement, something I'm obviously passionate about um, for the first time ever. Uh, marketers now have the ability to measure their the impact of the content they're creating on actual sales down the funnel stuff. Um, yep. It's never been available for, right? We've never been able to say a seller showed this presentation on nine deals that closed. And this slide is the most viewed by the buyers in the room after we send it to them. We've never been able to do that before, but now we can. Uh, on top of that, you've got AIs working in the background that are saying, hey, here's a trend you would never have even picked up. So I think marketers are, are starting to gain an upper hand again, which I think is pretty cool. So we got just a couple more minutes here before we got to wrap up. But I think that, yeah, you know, there's certainly like stages of adoption of sales enablement that we're kind of like implying here. Um, yeah. And I know there's a, there's a ton of great, you know, bigteamcanada.com. Go t- check out some of their content. So the benchmark research we've done together is up there as well. Yeah. I yeah. want to take a leap forward to where I think a lot of companies aren't necessarily today, but just to use this as a way of talking about, I think just how, impactful and expansive sales enablement can have in an organization because it's not just about net new business talk right. about what sales enablement can do for the entire customer life cycle and the impact you're seeing from some of those advanced companies that are not just applying it to sales but applying it to account management upsell cross-sell renewals etc yeah i mean it kind of comes back to first principles which is a keep your customers mm-hmm. b expand your customers c get new customers right that's how you grow a business so you know, if you're if you're a highly successful sales enablement organization is applying those principles of sales enablement to each of those parts of their business, right? They are training their, their customer success and support teams how to speak to customers correctly using tools and processes. They're using the right materials. They're measuring the effect of those materials at each one of those phases, right? Keeping customers, getting customers, expanding customers. So it, the, the companies that are doing this right are putting this at every revenue touch point, not just to go grab new business touch point. Right, um, so right. I 100% believe that's true. And they're using the data. Now, this is the thing that scares me the most for companies that aren't invested in sales enablement today, that the companies that are doing this now are gathering data. They're getting tons of touch points out there in the world. Those touch points are being used by machines to learn and create new learning. The companies that are going to create the most data now are going to be able to create something I call escape velocity. Right. This mm-hmm. is like when you escape the velocity to get outside of the planet. Right. You cannot catch them. Their machines are learning linear on a bigger data set. Right. Um, so you must you, you've got to be thinking about how to do this now and at every part of your revenue cycle. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and just, you know, real quick before we have to wrap up here, I mean, yeah, to, to blow course. people's mind even further, you think about, OK, not just acquisition, but acquisition, retention, renewals, not just direct sales, partner management. Right. So you yeah. think about the opportunity in these tools from an enablement standpoint to not only educate your partners and mobilize them, but yeah. in, but mobilize them with tools that they can then leverage with their customers as well. The consistency of now the material management and the message management through your partner channels with this kind of technology, it just it exponentially increases its impact. There you go. There you go from linear to nonlinear results. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, awesome. Matt, I want to. I got one quick question before we close. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know if you saw, uh, I know you saw this, but what Six Sense was doing with the Empowered CMO board book. I just want to give yeah. a shout out to them. I think this is one of the, the most impactful things I've seen in a while. And I just want to give a shout out to Latin and her team for that. Uh, you know, I don't know if the statistic that uh, I heard was that only 26 uh, boards have females on them, which I think is about a top Fortune 1000 companies. I think that's mesmerizing. Um, so just, uh, just want to give a shout out to that because I think it's really important for your listeners to go check that out. Thank you for doing that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Yeah, Latney worked with, they worked with the Athena Alliance uh, to create a board book 
of qualified uh, female board members. And it's actually broken up by those that qualify for public company boards, private company yep. boards, um, some just amazing, amazing talent. Um, and we'll make sure there's a link to that. So thank you for, thank you for raising cool. that. All right. Well, thank you everyone for watching and listening today. Um, exciting conversation. I mean, this is, I feel like we're just at the tip of the iceberg for what sales enablement can do in organizations today. And we're, uh, there's a lot more innovation that uh, to come. So thank you very much for watching, watching, listening. Thank you, Dr. Bishop for being with us today. Um, and, uh, we'll see y'all next week. This is my name's Matt Hines. We'll see you next week on sales pipeline radio.